It is said that Thomas Jefferson didn't believe in the resurrection. In fact, he was so determined uh, that he was to, to refute the Bible teaching of the resurrection that he edited his own Bible. He had his own special version of the Bible in which every reference to the supernatural were deleted. Jefferson, in editing the Gospels, confined himself solely to the moral teachings of Jesus. Listen to me and listen to me good. The moral teachings of Jesus, as wonderful as they are, they will not save you. They will not save you. Nothing but the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus will save us. The closing words in Jefferson's Bible were they laid... Uh, Jesus in a tomb, they rolled the stone to the mouth of the sepulcher, and they departed the end. That's where his Bible ended. Thank God that's not how the story really ends. This evening, I want you to I want to give you a brief outline. First, let's talk about the truth of the resurrection and the testimony, simply the testimony of the gospel. And in verse 3, it deals with his death. Look at verse 3. He says, for I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Of course, we know that our Lord never sinned. Jesus never sinned, but you and I certainly have. And if Jesus was to become our substitute, then he must die for sin in our place. Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us back to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So there's a penalty for sin, and that's death. This was a fulfillment of prophecy. Listen to Isaiah chapter 53, that great chapter. In the Jewish culture, it's kind of that uh, forbidden chapter. And there's a reason, because it draws people to Jesus. In verses 10 and 11, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased God to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. The penalty of sin is death, and it had to be paid for. And, and some... 700 years, give or take, before Christ, Isaiah predicted it would be. Well, what about his burial? In verse 4, it says he was buried. Well, go to John's Gospel, chapter 19. And the Bible says they took the body of Jesus and they, they took linen cloths and spice, as was the matter of the Jews to bury, and they wrapped his body. Now, in the place where he was crucified, the Bible says there's a garden. And in the garden, there was a new sepulcher where no one had ever been laid in. And there they laid Jesus because the Jews' preparation day was at hand. For the sepulcher was close at hand. Again, fulfilled with a prophecy. Isaiah 53, 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was there any guile or deceit in his mouth. His, his death, his burial. What about that resurrection? Verse 17, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, yet you are still in your sins. The best part of the story is that on the third day, Jesus arose. And if the resurrection hadn't taken place, none of the rest of this story would have been significant. The crowning glory of the gospel message is that Jesus arose. The stone that covered that tomb for three days was rolled back to not to let Jesus out, but to let us go in. 
when believers enter that tomb, we, we are reminded that the gospel story is true. Jesus isn't there. He is risen just as the scriptures teach. When the women came early that morning to continue the anointing of the body because they did it so quickly, they were greeted by an angel who said, He is not here for he is risen. And he said, Come and see the place where the Lord was laid. So then the truth of the resurrection is found in the testimony of the gospel. The gospel means good news. The good news, Christ died, was buried, and he rose again. The testimony of the gospel. But what about the testimony of the witnesses? Keep in mind, here verses 5 through 8, uh, Paul just kind of gives us an idea of all the people who witnessed Jesus following the resurrection. When he, when he arose, he stayed on earth about 40 days. Uh, and through that extended period of time, many people saw him. He, he tells us in verse uh, 34 of Luke 24 that Peter saw him. We're told he was saw of the 12 disciples. We're told that at one point, 500 believers saw him. Uh, verse 6 of chapter 15 there in 1 Corinthians. Uh, the, the Bible says that the greater part remain unto this time. What does that mean? That means as Paul was writing this, that those 500 believers, he says that many of them, most of them, were still alive. In other words, if you don't believe me, Corinthians, go ask them. You see, to me, that's the evidence of the Bible. When the Bible was written, when these letters were passed around, there were, there, there, there were not people out there refuting it. Why? Because the people who lived it, who experienced it, were still alive. So 500 people. If you don't believe me, Paul says, go ask these people. They saw him. James, his half-brother, saw him. I believe that's what changed James' life. And Paul himself. He, he alludes to his, uh, in his testimony of seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the argument for the resurrection, and the first point is, uh, you know, the truth of the resurrection because the testimony of the gospel and the testimony of the witnesses. Here's the, here's the second thing. The significance of the resurrection. What is the significance of it? In verses 12 through 19, Paul lists the negatives the hard realities that would exist if the resurrection wasn't true. One, he said Christ would still be in the grave. This is what makes Christianity different than all other religions, right? The leaders of all these other religions of the world, they're still buried somewhere, but not Christ. Now listen to me. We have all these non-believers who say, well, the disciples stole his body. Come on, there was a regiment of Roman soldiers there. What in the world were a bunch of frightened fishermen who were locked up, boarded up somewhere? What were they going to do to battle Romans, to be able to roll a stone away and steal the body and hide it? How long would they be able to hide it before somebody found it? 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16 says that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of the angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. He's not in the ground. If Christ was still in the ground, our preaching would be in vain. That's what Paul says in verse 21. It would be a waste of time for me to stand here and preach. It would be a waste of time for me to prepare. It would be a waste of time for us to even be in church. If he had not come out of that grave, we're wasting our time. But he is alive, and it's the reason we preach the wonderful message that Jesus saves. 1 Corinthians 1.21, For after that, in the wisdom of God, and the world by wisdom knew not God, he said it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You know, it's kind of difficult for me to believe that my calling in my profession is foolishness. But the fact of it is, it is foolishness. 
the foolishness of preaching the gospel, but it saves people. If Christ were still in the grave, our faith would be in vain. Not just preaching in vain, but our faith. We believe in a living Christ. We believe in one who is alive and one who forgives, and one who saves, and one who intercedes for us, and one who will guide us through life, and one who will take us to glory in the future. This is our faith. We believe in him. If he had not come forth from the grave, all of the above would be for naught. It would be in vain. But thank God, he is alive. And listen, if he wasn't alive, we'd be false witnesses. Our message would be a false message. We'd be like the Jehovah Witnesses who deny the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'd have an empty story and we'd have no hope for anybody. Hey, if he wasn't alive, we'd still be in our sin. In John chapter 8 and verse 24, Jesus said, There I say unto you that you shall die in your sins if you believe not that I am he. If you don't believe in me, then you're going to die in your sins. We'd still be in our sins if Jesus wasn't risen. And then those who died believing would perish. You see, if the resurrection isn't true, then every person who's ever placed their faith in Jesus Christ would have perished forever. There, there would have been no hope of a resurrection for them. But Job said... I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though my skin uh, worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, my eyes shall behold him, and not another. And though my reins be consumed within me. Man, if Christ be not risen, we would be the most miserable. Can I tell you that today without Christ, we'd be lost? That there'd be no hope for none of us? That we'd be stuck in this terrible world contending with evil all around us until the day that we die? And, and then we'd have no hope beyond the grave? What a miserable experience, especially when we consider the experience that we've had with the Lord Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, no hope. By the way, that's the way most people live. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. And most people live their life in this miserable existence. They have rejected Christ. They have rejected the gospel message. And this miserable life is all they have. That is a wretched existence. But listen to this wonderful verse. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, who, who hath begotten us unto a living hope. We've been talking about the significance of the resurrection. Let me say, there's not a more important subject in all of God's Word. You see, all of God's Word was pushing toward that one event, that crucifixion, that burial, and that resurrection. And the validity of the very Word of God from Genesis to Revelation rests on the importance of the resurrection. Your faith and mine depend on the truth of the resurrection. What about the first fruits of the, of the resurrection? In verses 20 uh, through 22, listen, he says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterward, at his coming, the people 
of Christ. The first fruits were part of the the first part of the harvest that the faithful Jews would bring to the temple as a as an offering. It also helped to feed the priests there. Although Christ was not the first to rise from the dead, you remember just earlier he had Lazarus come back from the dead and Jairus' daughter, these things. People had died. Old Testament saints had died and been resurrected. Or, I mean, but Jesus was the first to never die again. And because of that, he is the front runner for us. He is the example. He is the proof of our eventual resurrection to eternal life. Adam brought death. Romans 5 verse 12, Therefore as by one man sin entered into the world by death, and so death passed upon all men that all have sinned. You see, the reason men die is because of sin. Sin brings death. Adam passed on this sin nature. Man doesn't die because Adam sinned. Listen to me. Man dies because of his sin. Woman dies because of her sin. Not just because we are sinners by nature, but we're also sinners by choice. Psalm 51 5 says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. God said in Genesis 3.19 that the sweat of your face shall shall thou eat bread, and thou will return into the ground from which thou was taken, from dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. Why? Because of sin. As he spoke those words to Adam, it was all because of sin. But Christ, through his death, burial, and ultimately resurrection, he brought life. Paul says, but where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Isn't that a wonderful truth? When I was dead in my trespasses and sin, God supplied grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he mentions in verse 23 the resurrection of the saints. In Romans 8 and 11, the Bible says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he raised up Christ from the dead, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit and dwelleth in you. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead resides in us that we might be saved. There's coming a day when all the saints who have passed on are going to hear the heavenly trumpet, they're going to come forth from that grave. You know that that passage of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those of us that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Why do we comfort with these words? Because you can bank on it. You can count on it. Aren't you glad tonight that you have heard the truth and that you have believed it and that you have received it and you're on your way to heaven? I'm so thankful for the study I've been doing on Wednesday night about heaven. It just encourages my heart the more I study and the more I understand it. I'm so thankful God's prepared a place for us and that he prepared He prepared a person for us and now he's prepared a place for us. There's argument for the resurrection. You see, the truth of the resurrection is the testimony of the gospel and the testimony of the witnesses people saw. Not just that, the lives changed by those disciples or of those disciples. There's that significance of the resurrection. We talk about all the negatives had there not been a resurrection. uh, Christ would still be in the grave and our preaching would be in vain and our faith would be in vain and we'd be false witnesses and we would still be in our sins and those who died believing in Christ would perish and we'd be miserable. We'd be a people to be pitied those first fruits of the resurrection, Christ first, then those who know him are going to follow him in that resurrection. Thank God that Jesus is not in a tomb in that Palestinian garden, but
but that he rests in the hearts and the lives of every believer, those who have received the truth, those who have repented of their sin, and who trust in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Aren't you excited today that Jesus has a place and a plan for your life? I hope I hope, if you're listening to me tonight, I hope that you've made your reservation with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't, please know I'm here to help. Comment below. Get in touch with me. I'd love to tell you about my Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're so thankful that Jesus is alive. He is alive and well. And we've got a story to tell. God, I'm so thankful today that you loved us so much that you gave your very best when we were at our very worst. And we've had an opportunity to come to know you and be reconciled to you by the precious blood of Jesus and that we're going to one day be with you because of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for this time, for this moment, for these people. In Jesus' name, I humbly pray. Amen.